If you have your Bibles there, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. There's so many things that I would love to speak to you about as we start a new year that I'd like to challenge you with, that I'd like to challenge myself with, and, and there's just so many different ways we could go with this sermon to try to start the new year out right. Last year we met, it was the new year, it was actually New Year's Day on that Sunday. Don't know if you remember, um, it may seem like a long time ago, it may seem like it just flashed by. Anybody like me this last year just flew by? I mean, it seems like yesterday, just a, it seems like a couple weeks ago, we were here January 1st, 2023, the first day of the year on a Sunday, having service together, and 365 days from today, we'll be meeting again. Yes, it's a leap year, but then it's also a couple days off on the, so we got an extra day and a couple, of, I counted the days, trust me, 365. We'll be here again. And the question is, will you be better off then than you are now? Will you be better off? You know, lots of times I will um, mention movies and I will mention to you that I, I love watching movies and, and this is all an effort to make sure you got to Ephesians chapter 5. Everybody got to Ephesians chapter 5? Okay. Um, there are certain moments in certain movies that really speak to me. And one of them is one of the few phrases in Latin that I know. If I say it, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Carpe diem. Seize the day. Was not a Christian movie, but there was a lot of good uh, things we could learn from there. There's some things that we need to not do that we get from that movie as well. Hollywood is good at that, aren't they? But uh, carpe diem, seize the day. There should be no day that goes by that we don't seize and take a hold of it and live it for Christ. That's carpe diem. Well, a lot of us know that just because we saw Robin Williams get up on top of a desk, I guess. But I want to teach you a different one today, and that is Tempest Fuji. Tempest Fuji. Time flies. Tempest Fuji, time flies. So you'd better carpe diem because Tempest Fuji. You better seize the day because time flies. Would you stand with me? Let's read verses 15 through 18. Now I'm going to speak mostly on uh, verses 15 and 16, but 17 and 18 kind of finish one of the thoughts, and I'm going to finish with a conclusion on verses 17 and 18. So we'll read all the verses really We'll talk about the context. You shouldn't be reading this section of the verses without reading all of Ephesians. It's one big letter, and it all comes together. We always should take things in context. But let's look at the verses here. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled instead with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive me for taking these verses when there's so much more, so much more full of these verses. The entire section, the context of this is just so rich. But I pray, Lord, that you'd Use these verses and what I've read that you bless the reading of your word and that you'd use the words I'm going to share to inspire people today. Lord, we remember these movies sometimes. We remember these scenes because they inspire us. And so, Lord, there is nothing more inspirational, more motivating, more beautiful than your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would get some of that excitement some of that excitement that we do when we go to a ball game or the movies or, or we do something that we really enjoy, I pray that we'd have some of that excitement this morning and we get excited about your word and the potential of living another day, maybe even another year in your will. So I just pray that you'd be in charge of the sermon. You challenge us. Don't let us be comfortable today. Make us better. Give us the strength, Lord, to make ourselves better that we live for you in this new year. 
For it's in your very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. May be seated. Well, 2024 already. Wow. Tempest Fuji. Time sure does fly. People try to say, you know, only when they're having fun. Kids will always tell me, why is it that vacations go so quick, but the school year goes so slow? I'll tell them, just, just hold on. Just hold your britches. Pretty soon, it's all going to fly. It's all going to go fast. Don't worry. It's all going to go quick. A lot of great statements have been said about time out there. Some by Christians, some not by Christians. Steve Jobs said the most precious resource that we all have is our time. Brian Norgard said, own time or time will own you. Wow. Michael Ashtelitter said, the bad news is time flies. The good news is you're the pilot. You get that? Flying. Just kind of fly. You with me? The good news is you're the pilot. You're the one that decides how you spend that time. Hmm. Harvey McKay said this. Time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once you've lost it, you can never get it back. You can never... Get it back. Like I said, I counted the days on the calendar. 365 days from now, I think it's on the 29th, I think it is, I can't remember, of December. We will meet again here, God willing, unless he takes us home before, amen? We'll meet again here next year at the end of 2024. We'll be back here again, December 29th. Yeah, I wrote it on my notes. We'll be back here again for another New Year's Day sermon. If the Lord grants me that, I'll be preaching it. If not, someone else will be preaching it. If, if we're not in heaven, we'll be together hopefully then. Hopefully we're all in heaven. He's taking us all home by then. And we're going to say the same things that we always do. Where did 24 go? Just like we're saying it today, amen? Where did 23 go? It went so fast. And the question is, will you spend 2024 wisely or will you waste it? Because once it's gone, you can never get it back. It goes by like a vapor, like a smoke, like a mist. It's gone, just like that. Time goes so quickly that we must make the most of the time that we are given by God. I want to make sure you understand. This is not in your outline, but I want to make sure that you understand this. Every second you have in life is a gift from God. You say, well, my days don't feel like gifts. Listen, like I told you last week, sometimes you open gifts and you get socks and underwear. And sometimes you get the Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Remember that one? That was my favorite. I loved that game. Just beating the crud out of the other robot until his head popped off. Sometimes you get the underwear. Sometimes you get the robots. But it's all a gift. And God knows what is best. Every second you get is a gift from God. And the question is, are you going to make the most of this year? I guess a better question would be, did you make the most of this last year? Or are you sitting there with regret? Depending on what statistics you read, and, and I don't know how you can trust these things on statistics, right? Um, you know, you've seen that quote by Abraham Lincoln. He said, you can't trust everything you read on the internet. You ever seen that one? I'm going to let that sink in. 1865, 1861, dead, internet, not there. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't know the statistics, which ones you can, you can listen to. But depending on which ones you look at, 40% to 80% of the people interviewed, the people polled, say that they have significant regret in how they spent their time this year. And if they could go back, they would do it completely different. Can you imagine if that's correct? Let's take the middle of that. Over half, 60% of people feel like that they regret how they spent 2023. That's sad. 
You know it's coming. The only thing you know about tomorrow is that it's coming. Time is coming. I can't tell you anything more unless the Lord comes again. I can't tell you anything more about tomorrow except that it's coming. So as long as you know it's coming, we need to make the most of the time we have. And so the question is, did you use 23 wisely? And if you're one of those 60% of people, are you going to change to make 24 a better year? Think about it. If you could go back and do 23 over again, what would you change? Would you come to church more? Would you come to church less? Would you be more friendly? Would you do more visiting? Would you do more calls? Would you do less? Would you take more time off? Would you do more work? Would you change what work you did? Would you change who you spoke to? Would you take advantage of opportunities that you got that you didn't realize were going to disappear when they did? What would you change? What would you do? You're outlined there the key to living any year, and you want to call it a successful year, the key to having a successful year, however you define that, really is being in the middle of the will of God. That's what a successful year is. As I asked you that question, what would you change? Hopefully, it took you back to thoughts of things that you could have done better for Christ. Because the only way to live a successful year is... To live smack dab in the middle of the will of God. Here's the hard part about the will of God. Um, it's not always my will. Amen? It's not always your will. It's not always our will. What God's will is is not always what, God, what we want to do. But we do know this. This should be a big amen. His will is always what's best. Amen. Could be harder. Could be tough. It could be the equivalent of that, you know, socks and underwear one that you, that you open. But sometimes that's exactly what we need. Amen? God knows what we need. That's what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I alluded to this a second ago. It's really hard for me to pick verses in Ephesians anytime, any sermon. But especially in Ephesians, it's so hard for me to pick verses out and try to preach a sermon on it. It should be, it should be one long series of sermons because Ephesians is so great and there's so much context to it. It's so rich. But the context of these verses, if you allow me to kind of try to summarize it because of time's sake here, is this. In chapters 4 and 5 of Ephesians, Paul has been begging the reader to walk worthy, which is an example, it's a way of saying, you know, to live your life. Walk worthy, meaning live your life as you walk along, as you live your life. Walk worthy of the calling that you have in Christ. I want you to think about this. It's chapter 4, verse 1, where he kind of mentions that uh, in Ephesians. And he says, walk worthy. Live in a way that you live up to the calling that you have in Christ. I want you to think for a second. I don't know if you noticed, but there's some fresh snow on some of the mountains. As you came in today, now some of you probably think it was freezing. I came in thanking God that I was not sweating. I love this weather. Gordo and I came in and said, this is, this is what heaven's going to feel like right here. Okay? I love this. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I want you to understand, the God that made those mountains, and then made the oceans, and then made those beautiful deserts, you know, Joshua Tree and all those, those the, it's beautiful out there. I don't know if you can understand the beauty of some of those deserts. It's real beautiful. Like the God that made all of those things, that same God has a purpose and a plan for you for this year. So while he's making the mountains, this is how I would do it. Now, God would do it a lot better because he's God. I'm not. But this is how I would do it. I'd be like, okay, uh, I've got to make the mountains. Check. I've got to make the stars. Check. Oh, yeah. I've got to come up with uh, Mike's, uh, Mike Castillo's. I've got to come up with his purpose of life. Okay, check. All right, now I've got to make the Pacific Ocean. Check. Okay, I've got to make Frank's uh, purpose in his life. Check. Do you understand? That's where you rank. Like that God died for you. That's how much God loves you. He has a purpose for you. And so Paul is saying to these guys, hey guys, you're not living your life in a way that says that you are respectful of the calling you have on your life. 
God sent his son to die on the cross for you. He rose again so he could live in you. Do you understand that? So now he says you need to live your life in a way that says that you are in honor of that. You are living your life worthy of the calling of God because that's, that's an awesome calling. God has a plan for you this year. And if somehow Satan has convinced you that he doesn't have a plan for you or that you're screwed up or that something else is missing or something else is lacking or something else is wrong, let me just tell you this. That is Satan trying to convince you that God doesn't have a plan for you. He has a perfect plan for your life this year. That's how awesome our God is. And he says, I want you to live your life in worthy of the calling that you have. Live your life in worthy of the calling that God has on your life. Going back to the whole chapter, the whole book, so you get the context of what he says in these verses we're going to talk about. He says in chapter 1, verse 3, he said, um, we have every spiritual blessing from God. Are we blessed greatly by God? Boy, that was weak. You would think you were up all night last night, you know, celebrating New Year's, but that's tonight. Come on, people. Hey, are we blessed by God? Yes, okay. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 say that once we were spiritually dead, but Christ gave us life. Amen? There's something to be happy about. Chapter 2, verse 12 says that we've been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. God perfect. You and I, sinners. Big chasm. Jesus, bridge the gap. You've got to say amen to that. So that's something to be thankful for. Okay? Uh, chapter 2, verse 14 says, The Jews and Gentiles have been brought together because of the cross. Um, unless your last name is Epstein or you're you know, of Jewish descent, you should be pretty happy that the Gentiles were given the same opportunities that the God's chosen people were. Amen? amen. Gentiles, say amen. 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 There you go. Hey, we got the same opportunity. That's how much he loves us. We're now considered his people. Isn't that awesome or what? In verses nine, uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, he says, guess what, guys? We're no longer strangers with Christ. Why? Because our bodies now are the temple that Christ lives in. Christ loves you so much, now he lives in you. Do you understand how great this stuff is? I, I'll do this whole paragraph over if you don't start saying amen more. <laughs> this, this is how exciting this is. Do you understand how great this is? We are blessed. Okay, that's not even all of it. Chapter 3, verse 6, he says, listen, now you guys that feel weak and you feel like you can't do anything, guess what? When you ask God to come into your heart, he gives you the Holy Spirit. That's the same Holy Spirit that was there when he was creating the world. In other words, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do exactly what God has called you to do. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. You have the power to do whatever he's called you to do by the Holy Spirit. So because of all of this, we should live, and more. There's so much more in Ephesians. That's just a taste of how much Paul is telling them. Guys, do you understand how great your life is, how great God has blessed you? Because of all of this and more, we should live a life that worthy of the stuff that we've been given, the blessings that we've been given by God. Every day when you get up, I don't care how you feel. I don't care if your bones ache. I don't care if you're doing something you don't want to do that day. You should be excited to live that day for Christ because it was a gift from Christ to begin with. And there's going to be days you wake up for uh, in 2024 and you don't feel like getting up out of bed. I just got to remember, God has done so much for me. This is the least I can do is live my life for him today. Because I'm not promised tomorrow. I don't want to be ugly. I don't want to be scary. I don't want to be cryptic or whatever the word is. But, you know, statistics say that not all of us will be around to see 2025. We got to live every day to the fullest. Because you're never promised the next day. You're never promised the next day. And God deserves our best. So, in chapter 5, verse 15, Paul picks up this concept of living a life worthy of God's calling. And he says in 5, verse 15, he emphasizes that for it to be a worthy walk, and again, walk is a, a symbolism, it's an example of living our lives, right? For it to be a worthy life, we must, number one, it must be a careful walk. For it to be a worthy walk, it must be a careful walk. Okay? Now, some of you have different versions. I have, I think, the New American Standard is what I grabbed. 
uh, no, English Standard Version, the ESV is what I grabbed. Okay, so 5, five verse 15 again. Look carefully then how you walk. Look carefully. Live your lives. If you want to live a life that God is pleased with in 2024, you got to be careful. You can't be a bull in a china shop. There's a reason why they have that expression. Because what would happen to a china shop with a bull in it? See, I watch these um, memes sometimes. And they're pretty hilarious. And these people, they think they're funny. And they stand in front of the bull. And they do this. They're not matadors like professional. You know, they're not. I don't, I don't know if that's how they stand. But <laughs> not a whole lot of matadoring on ESPN every night when I watch the highlights. So, so uh, but these... It, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. These idiots who think that they can stand there and tempt a bull and get out of there without becoming a meme. And then the next thing you know, they're getting launched in the air 30 feet. Huh? Hello? What did you think was going to happen? You got in the ring with a bull. You got to be careful. There's a reason why he says, if you're going to live a life that's worthy of God's calling this year, you need to be careful about every step you take. You can't just go live. These people that say this, well, you know, it's easier to uh, just go ahead and do it without permission and then apologize later. Do me a favor. Stay away from me, okay? <laughs> because I don't need those kind of people in my life. I do enough damage on my own. I don't need your help. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? God didn't call us to be a bull in a china shop. He said to live a careful life. What do you mean, Pastor? What do you mean? That word carefully. Maybe you have the King James. Anybody have the word circumspect? I love that word. See, here's where these new versions that I love. I love some of these versions really good. These are great versions, okay, to understand God's words better. But every once in a while, you lose a little bit in the translation when they kind of try to make it easier to understand. That word circumspect, it's a Greek word, akrobos. I practiced that so it would sound correct. Acrobos. Okay? And that word acrobos means to be exact. To be very, very thorough. Okay? It's where we get our word accurate from. Okay? To be precise while examining and investigating something with great care and very great alertness. If you are acrobos, you think carefully before saying or doing anything. Anybody have a time this year in 2023 where you said something and as soon as the word got out, you wanted to quickly grab it and shove it back in. But you couldn't fit it in there because your foot was already in your mouth. So Why? Because you weren't careful. You weren't acrobos with your words. Remember when grandma said count to ten? Mom knew you better than grandma. She was like, no, you need to count to 10,000. I know your temper. <laughs> right? You need to be careful. You need to be acrobos. If you're going to make the most of your time this year, you've got to be careful. You've got to look around. You've got to be intelligent. Watch your steps so you don't stumble. So I was reading one sermon online. And his name was Dr. C. Campbell Morgan. And he gave a great, I was trying to figure out more about this word circumspect or acrobos. He said, let me give an example of what acrobos is. He said, in my town, he lived in a little town. He said, there was a gardener that made a, um, <clears throat> that made a, a, a garden. And it was a vegetable garden. And a lot of the critters, creatures, um, the little you know, creatures from around the town would come and eat the garden, come and eat the vegetables. Anybody have that problem? They eat your vegetables? Okay. All right. So he said the gardener got a good idea. So the gardener built a wall over around the garden. And guess what? The animals just jumped over the wall. whoop de doo whoop de doo So he said I got, he got smarter. And on the top of the, on the, top of the wall, he, he put in some cement. And then he, put, he broke a bunch of glass. And he put the glass in the cement. So when it dried, the whole top was like a little makeshift kind of like, you know, razors on the top. And he said, sure enough, the next day he looked out there and there was a cat on top of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> B 
being what? Akrabas. Every step, carefully placing the feet down. And guess what? The cat got down and ate some of the garden. Because why? Because he was Akrabas. He was careful with every single step. He said that is how Christians should live their lives. Every step is important. Every word you say this year has consequences. Every place you go this year has consequences. Every thought you have this year has consequences. Every person you hang around with this year has consequences. So think carefully before you get in the ring with the bull and you get stuck with the horns. Because that's what life will do to you. Amen? Be acrobos. Be careful. You also know what circumspect is? I want you to, I found this in, in one of my um, commentaries talking about the uh, actual meaning of the word. It says to also be aware. It's not just to be aware of every step that you take, okay, to be careful. But it's also, acrobos was also used um, in those days to describe, you need to be aware of the moments that you are at ease or you have nothing to do. Christians, let me tell you this. Oftentimes, we are really good when the pressure is on because we're focused on Christ and we're doing what God wants us to do. And when we know people are watching, we're going to live and say and do what Christ wants us to do. Amen? And then nobody's watching and we're all alone and we think nobody sees and sometimes we make the worst choices possible. And so the flip side of that acrobos, that, de that definition of that word, meant that if you're going to be circumspect, you're not just watching when everybody, you're not just being careful about when everybody watches, you're also being careful when no one's watching. Because often that's when Christians make their biggest mistakes. This year in 2024, there are going to be times where you're all alone. And you think, well, nobody's watching. God is always watching. Amen? He's always watching. He always sees what is happening. And so you need to be careful about those times where you say, I have nothing to do. Listen, I'm not telling you that there's not good time. There is time for leisure and relaxing and taking time off to refocus, recharge. That's fantastic. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. How much of that? How often? When? All that. But when you do it, make sure you're still focused on Christ and not focused on yourself. Because you get focused on yourself, and boy, the flesh comes up, and man, you can start making bad decisions. Ask any kid with a cell phone. Oh. Ask any adult with a cell phone. Sometimes they think nobody's watching. God is watching. And Google. <laughs> and all those other places are watching, too. Yeah. Those are the times that Satan can get you the worst. Then there's that word at the end of verse 15. Look at the end of verse 15. It says, uh, look carefully, then how you walk, not as the unwise, but as the wise. He wants you to be like a wise person in 2024. Be like a wise person. That word wise, it says at the end of that word, um, it's the word sophos. Now, there were different words they could have used for wise. In our, in our language, we use wise to kind of mean several different things. But they had different words they could have used. Sophos, S-O-P-H-O-S is the way we would spell it. Obviously, not the way they spell it. But this word meant it's practical application of acquired knowledge. So in other words, to practically use your, the, 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 uh, the knowledge you have, you have to apply, you have to get the knowledge first. You're getting the knowledge right now. You're going to church. You're studying your Bible every day. You're reading the Bible every day. You're, you're praying every day. You're focused on God every day. And as you, and, you know, bring in that knowledge, you try to sophos, you try to apply it. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Anyone that does any kind of devotion time every day, you're going to say amen to this because you know it's true. I don't care how many times, God, it never ceases to amaze me that whatever devotion, whatever scriptures I read that morning is exactly what I end up having to use that day. It's almost like God knew what he was doing. 
Because he knew exactly what he was doing. And guess what? You could be going through a different thing, read the same verses, and he would apply that to your life. The same verse. That's how great our God is. That's the kind of God we serve. Practical application of acquired knowledge. You got to acquire the knowledge. You got to get in. You got to study. You got to read. And then trust me, he will show you times where you can use that in your life. I mean, it's, God is so good. Amen? So, use it as the wise, not the unwise. Verse 16, he describes what the unwise do. He says, um, let me give you a, different, a little description of what an unwise person does. Verse 16, making the best, here's what a wise person does, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. What does a wise person do? They make the best use of the time they have. I don't care if you're in the hospital going through treatments. You make the best use of the time you have. I don't care if you're going through difficult... Some of us are going to just... The, it's, the, it's probability. Statistics tell me. Some of us are going to have one of the toughest years we've ever had in our lives in 2024. No amens on that one, huh? Hey, you know what? There should be an amen because God is still bigger than all of it. Amen. And so even though it's going to be the toughest year you've ever had, some of you are saying, it better not be better, tougher than this year I just had. Our God is still bigger. And if you haven't learned that lesson yet, it may be that he's going to let more stuff come your way until you do learn that lesson. I don't know. You just better learn the lesson. Our God is that good. So verse 16 says that if you're wise, you make the most out of every opportunity God gives you. So you go to the store this year, you're going to have mundane days where you get up and you say, well, today's just a bunch of the honeydew list. I've got to go to the store. I've got to go get the groceries. I've got to go do this. got to do that. Here's our God. Our God is so good, he can work at Target. <laughs> our God is so awesome, he can be a witness in the line at the 10 or less line when the person in front of you has 14 items. And you know it because you counted them. And God can still use you. God, is not, God does not go with you to the doors of Walmart and just say, oh, sorry, can't go inside. God is everywhere and he can use you everywhere this year no matter where you're at. Make the most of every opportunity you got. Even those bad times this year. Even when the bad times come this year, he can take that and make the most of that opportunity. Hmm? He can make the most. And I bet some of you could give me firsthand accounts of how he has taken rough times this year. And you've seen how God takes what the world means for bad and he takes and uses it for good. Because that's how powerful he is. Nothing this world has is going to beat him. Nothing. So make the best of every opportunity that comes this year in 2024. Use those opportunities wisely. You heard me. Those bad times that happen, they are opportunities. You say, oh, it's not an opportunity. It's a bad time. No, it's not. It's an opportunity. You say, but pastor, that's a bad thing. Listen, opportunities come in different packages. Blessings, difficulties, deaths, births. Opportunities come. They come at home, they come at the hospital, they come at the store, they come random, just random, you know, interactions. You think, oh, that was just an accident that happened. No, it wasn't. God was in charge the whole time. It was an opportunity for you to bless or to witness or to something for him. If we just look at 2024 as a unique opportunity that we will never get again, if you live to be, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years past this year, You'll never get 24 back. We get to have 2024 one time. It's going to be such a good year, we got an extra day in it. <laughs> That's how awesome a year it's going to be. And you say, Why is it going to be awesome? Because I know my God is awesome. Oh, we're going to have funerals. We're going to have problems. We're going to have cancer um, diagnosis. We're going to have all kinds of bad stuff happen. But none of it is bigger than God. That's how I know 
but this is going to be a good year if you will make the most. Now, the word that is translated, our language has a hard time sometimes translating from what the Bible was written in. You understand? It's just a beautiful language that it was written in, okay? And in this case, you know, it's Greek. And so it was an ex we have to use an expression to mean this one word. It says, um, to be wise, and then it says, making the best use of. Now, if you have one of those Bibles that gives you some of the words in Greek or Hebrew, you know, the whole expression is underlined, and then there's a number right there. Strong's has it. There's a couple other um, and producers, manufacturers, whatever you call it, that, that do that, you know, people that do that. Strong's has this, the one I have is the Strong's Bible. And, and it tells you that whole underline, it's, it's a phrase, but it was one word. That word in the Greek was the word exorgazo. Now, I didn't practice that one, so I know I'm saying that one wrong. Somebody's watching this online saying, that moron can't even pronounce it. It's okay. I've been called worse. Okay. So it comes from the word that they would use to go to the marketplace. So let's think about this for a second. It says, be as wise people, making the best use of your time. They would use this ex exorgazo. They would use this word when they were going to the marketplace, like when they would go shopping. It used to be before the internet. Do you remember? And it's still a big deal now, but now it's not as big because Amazon is everywhere. But remember in the days before Amazon, before the internet, Black Friday? I remember my friend back there, I remember talking to uh, Erica about, she was going to go shopping on Black Friday. I said, what time are you going to get up? Oh, I'm going to be up at 3 a.m. I said, girl, I love you, but you crazy in the head. And she'd be up 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, standing in line all the way around the building, why? Because there were some deals. And there were some deals. It was the truth. Okay? It was the truth. You get a thousand dollar TV for 250 bucks. There were some good deals. You know what that was called? I'm going to say it wrong. Exergazo. <laughs> That's what this word meant. It meant going to the market and being watching out and getting the best deal. You get it? You see, when I go shopping, I am anti exergazo, whatever that word means. I just like, hey, it's the first thing on the end cap. That's mine, baby. Let's go. I'm in. I'm out. I'm out of here. My wife's like, no, 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 no. Wait, hold on. We're going to find a better deal. There's a better shop over here. Oh, I got a better. I'm going to save a little bit over here. I'm going to save a little bit over there. I, it drives me nuts. I said, I'm going to wait for you in the car. <laughs> but there's a good reason why. She sends me to the, you know, the store for her milk. I come back. With 150 bucks I spent at Target. She said, I sent you for a three thousand, four, well, how much is getting milk now? Five, six, it probably went up a buck since I started the sermon. Seven. <laughs> okay. She sent me for, you know, five dollars of milk. I come back with $150 and I forgot the milk. <laughs> okay. But I saw so I'm the opposite. She goes in, she finds the best deals. She finds, she's smart, she's wise. She's looking for it. She says, oh, no, I'm going to wait for that. That's going to go on sale later. I'm going to wait for that. Exergazo, exergazo. Be smart. Look for the best opportunities. Be wise. When you are making the best use of your time, you look and you say, hmm, maybe right now it's just the time this year just to be a friend right now and love them. I'll tell them about Jesus later. You're praying about it. You're thinking about when to tell them about Jesus. You say, you know what? They're going through a hard time. I think about Jesus right now, so I'll just call and see how they're doing. I'm not going to call and say, guess what? If you had Jesus, you wouldn't be so sad right now. <laughs> no, you make the best use. You're careful. You make good use of your deals. You plan. You schedule. You, 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 know, you say, hey, you know what, God? There's some reason why so-and-so is on my heart. Anybody had somebody on their heart recently? A person's name on your heart? Okay. That's not an accident, people. That's the Holy Spirit. So now, you better exergazo, you better do it correctly, you better plan how you're going to help them, how you're going to love them, how you're going to reach them. You say, well, pastor, they told me, I don't want to hear any more about that God stuff. Okay, did God take them off of your heart? No? Well, I guess you better figure out another way to love them then, shouldn't you? You better plan it out, you better reach, and you better find a plan or how to reach and get, you understand what I'm saying? Like in a marketplace where you're planning out, and you're being smart, and you're being careful, and you're wise. That's how you make sure at the end of the year you say, 
I did a good job this year. That's how, at the end of the year, God can look at you and say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Great job. Good 2024. Good job. Isn't that what we want God to do? Amen. Exergazo. Okay? It comes from just, you know, shopping, looking for the best bargains, knowing how to, to do things correctly, making the most of the opportunities. Saying, I don't care what time something goes on sale, I'm going to be there. If it means i got to be there at 3 a.m. outside in the cold, I'm going to be there to get that sale. You say, what's that got to do with God? There could be times this year where somebody calls you on the phone, and you pick up your phone and you see their name. And immediately a, a, a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach hits, and you say, oh, this is going to be two hours of my life I'm never going to get back. See, that's not exergazo. You know what that is? That's like Lincoln running to the store, seeing whatever's on the end cap, shoving it in the, 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 the cart, and going up and saying, come on, just, I don't care how much it is. Here's my card. Come on, I just want to go home. That's not wise shopping, is it? It's not wise. See, that's not exergazo. Here's exergazo. Whew. All right, they must need me right now. Maybe they just need somebody to hear them. Maybe they just need help. Maybe I just, maybe this is time. There are going to be days where you want a days off in 24 and God says, no, sorry, not a day off today. You're going to go serve somebody. You're going to go love somebody. You're going to go help somebody. And at the end of the year, cumulatively, you have led them to the Lord. And it doesn't happen one time. It's several times put together. Right? It's several times put together. And that's how you can lead them to the Lord. To make the most of 2024, you cannot waste any energy. You cannot waste any money or any of your talent on anything that's not specifically God's will. Because you are net, if you say, ah, it's no big deal, I can always do it tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. That great theologian, Apollo Creed, <laughs> said, there is no tomorrow. Rocky Three, people. It's a classic. Okay? It's a classic. Right? It's right up there with Rocky One, Rocky Four, I'm not sure which one. Two, five, six. I like them all. That you don't, you're not promised tomorrow. You better serve God today. You should be exhausted serving God every day. When you put your head on the pillow, you say, I did everything I could to serve God today. If there's a day where you say, I didn't, well, I don't think you carpe diem, did you? No, you lazy diemed. <laughs> you didn't carpe diem. Hmm. Pastor Harry Ironside says that time is given to us in view of eternity. I love that. Great author. He's a Southern Baptist author. Great, great author. He said, time is given to us so God gives it to us in view of eternity. So in other words, the gift you got, God gave to you thinking about eternity. You with me? So therefore, how you use it should be in view of eternity. So the time that you have today is not about you. Oh, I need some me time. Most of us don't need any more me time. We have plenty of me time. We need some more others time. We need some more Jesus time. Amen? Amen. We need a little less me time. America thinks you deserve a bunch of me time. I want you to think about the whole story seriously now. When Jesus was put up for those mock trials that were just, they were just, they were a joke. And then eventually he was crucified. Tell me, how much me time did Jesus get? Zero. It was all about you, wasn't it? In fact, he died for you. No me time. It was all others time. You see, you want to have a better 2024? How about you have a little bit more others time and a little less me time? You say, well, I got to have rest. I got to have that. I get you. I hear you. I'm not saying you can't. But that needs to be from the Holy Spirit, not from you. Because if it's from you, you're going to get lazy. You're going to have too much. It's just, it's just human nature, right? It needs to be from God. All our steps need to be directed by God. Huh? 
Frank's got a song. He'll sing it for you sometime. The, the Steps of a Righteous Man. We used to sing it at camp. I might have Stephanie come up and sing it for us. She might have. She knows that song. The Steps of a Righteous Man. Because the, they're ordered by who? By me? No, they're ordered by God. God tells me where the right step should be. Because if it's up to me, I step on the glass. If it's up to God, he shows me how to step in between those problems. Amen? Pastor Adrian Rogers, another pastor I really love, he talks about, look, look, this, this verse is talking about redeeming the time. So we're going to zoom through it because I want to make, I'm going to get to verse 16. And this is too much for this sermon. I'm just going to zoom through it. He says there's four things you've got to get. If you're thinking about the redeeming your time, there's four principles. Okay? He says, first of all, there's the prayer principle. You want to make the most of your time, you've got to pray. I want to make sure there's a big amen on this. Listen to me carefully. You can't make the most of your time if you are not praying. Period. You can go out and feed the poor, feed the homeless, you know, save all the dogs and cats. Aren't those commercials just... I'm like, stop. You're just playing with me. You're just, you're just trying to suck my whole account dry right now. <laughs> Show me a dog out in the cold. My wife's going to come home. There's going to be 46 dogs in my house because I can't stand those commercials. <laughs> Drive me crazy. <sighs> Listen, you can't live a perfect day without praying what God wants you to do in that day. He's the one that gave you the time. Don't you think the one that gave you the time uh, deserves to be consulted how you spend the time? Right? Someone gives a gift. We just got a gift recently to the church. It's end of the year and they're thinking about taxes. and it's not, That's not a bad thing. They're being smart. That's not, that's not a bad thing. So they gave us a gift, and um, it's towards some fans in the gym. And if you've ever been in our gym in the, in the summertime, you know that's a blessing from God. 150 degrees in there on a cool day. Okay? Somebody gave us a donation. This, that would be like, what if I, what if I got that donation? They said, I'm going to give it to that. And then I said, no, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use that for the pastoral trip fund. <laughs> Where Pastor Frank and I... Pastor David and Juan Carlos, we go to Vegas. <laughs> you know what's sad? That's happening in some places. Amen? That's sad. No, if that's what they gave it for, then that's what it needs to be spent on. If God gave you time and said, this is a gift from me, then you owe it to him to spend the time he gives you for him. Amen? Amen. Not turn around and use it on whatever you want. No. Listen, you know the right thing to do if us pastors did that and we took that money? You know the right thing to do? Would be to fire us. Period. If you can't trust us, we can't lead you. So therefore... It's no less important when God gives us the time and then we spend it on ourselves. That's out of line. It's a gift from him. It ought to be spent for him. Got quiet. Prayer, I stole this from, uh, I can't remember which commentator sermon. I heard it somewhere. I just really like this. Prayer is the key that unlocks the door of opportunity in the morning. I mean, that should be on a t-shirt for crying out loud. That is awesome. <laughs> Prayer is the key that unlocks the door to opportunity. Huh? Isn't that great? Number two, the priority principle. See, after you pray, then you've got to make a very important decision that each moment of the day is about God. That you spend every moment on God. The greatest danger of each day is letting the urgent things crowd out the more, the important things. Now, here's the hard thing. You have to decide what to do every day. And sometimes there's just a lot of good things. I know if one of the things pops in your head, like robbing a bank, you're not going to, you're going to say, that's not godly. I could easily make that decision. Wow, I must be godly. I decided not to rob a bank. No, I'm talking about those days where it's good and even better. There's two good things. And you're not sure what to do. Okay? 
Satan would love for you to spend your time on the stuff that you feel is urgent. But God says that's not what's important. I want to be like brutally honest with you here. This is something I struggle with. Because I like to get things on a list done. And so the list becomes urgent. And sometimes God says, no, that's not what's important. I didn't say it was bad. It's not as important as what God says to do. And Satan would love, you know what Satan would love for you to do today? He would love for you to go out and help the homeless today and not go to church. You say, how can that be? Because there's a lot of people that are out helping the homeless and eventually they're going to go to hell because they don't know Jesus. I didn't say it was bad to help the homeless. I didn't say it was bad to help people. What I'm saying is sometimes it's not what's best. God's will is what's best. And you can keep yourself busy doing a lot of good things. You could miss church today and say, we're going to have some family time. And all of us would say family time is important. Our families are a gift from God. Amen? Not a whole lot of amens. We just had the holidays. I realize you might be a little sick of them. But okay, that's all right. Okay. Listen, families are a gift from God. Okay. Now, spending time with your family, gift from God. But that doesn't mean that God wants me to skip church today and go spend time with my family. Ouch. Yeah. You should hear the excuses. I'm sure you hear them too. All the reasons why people skip church. None of them answer the question that says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Say, but we got this and it's very important, it's very good and it's very important. whoop dee dee It's not more important than God. You've let the urgent crowd out the important. That's how you can, you want to you get to the end of 24 and say, wow, that was a wasted year. Spend your time on all the urgent stuff and don't pay attention to the important stuff. You want to get to the end of 24 and say, I've lived a great year. I got everything out of this year I could. Wouldn't that be a great feeling? Then you spend your time on the important stuff and don't let Satan distract you with a bunch of urgency. Huh? You with me? There's more important things. I, I'm, I don't know if you totally understand what I'm saying. There are times, like I told you, I, I, I struggle with this sometimes. Um, we get one day a week where I can get out and do the yard. I like doing yard work. And I don't like seeing my yard look like it's not done. You hear what I'm saying? Weeds are from the devil. Okay? I hate weeds. Okay. So there are times on a Saturday where I'm not ready for my sermon. It's not completed. It's not finished. But because I am so like type A, I want to get this thing done. I got to get my yard done. I will tell myself sometimes, not always, but sometimes it wins out. My flesh wins out. And I'll say, it's very important. It's very urgent that I get my yard done. I got to get my yard done so that when I come in after several hours of doing the yard and I'm exhausted because I'm 112 years old and I, I just don't recover as fast as I used to. No amen from anybody else? <laughs> don't recover as fast as I used to, Right? Now I can't put my best into finishing studying for my sermon, which was more important. I didn't say doing the yard was wrong. I didn't say that that was a sin. What I'm saying is if I choose that over what's important, now it is a sin. I don't know if you're hearing, I don't know if you're hearing me. Because there's stuff we do. It's not bad, but it's not the best. It's not the best. Hmm, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. I'm not, I'm not done saying to that to you. I don't want to say more. The promptness principle, he says, is the next one. Being prompt. This deals with procrastination. Oh, boy. Well, again, some of us are looking around at each other. That's you. Are you listening to him? That's you. James chapter 4, verse 17. I marked it. I want you to hear this. So... Obviously, it goes together with the context of the other verses. So it's dangerous taking one verse out, but it does make my point. So, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. If you know the right thing to do 
and you don't do it, it's a sin. Procrastination. We say, but I'm going to do it tomorrow. How many times does tomorrow become never? How many times? How many times does tomorrow become never? Hmm. Yeah. Sin is not just merely doing wrong. It's also the failure to do what is right. So if you sin because you did something wrong, then that's a sin. But you can also sin by not doing what is right. Enough said. Um, <clears throat> I put a note on here. Procrastination and disobedience are shades of the same exact sin. Ouch. Number four, the power principle. We must develop the willpower to do what the Holy Spirit tells us to do. And nothing else matters. If you want to have a 2024 that you can be proud of, that you can say, I did what God called me to do, then you've got to do what the Holy Spirit is calling you to do. Not what your parents are telling you to do. Not what your friends are telling you to do. Not what your loved ones are telling you to do. Not what the world is telling you to do. You need to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Catch that? See, some of those people love you and they want what's best for you, but the Holy Spirit's not talking to them. He's talking to you. And you need to know what the Holy Spirit's calling you to do. We don't need to... Uh, listen, some of you are like, man, I, pastor's just telling me I didn't work hard enough in 2023. No, some of you worked plenty hard. You just worked on what was urgent, not what was important. I'm not telling you to work harder in 2024. If you are lazy, then I'm telling you to work harder. Work harder, you lazy bum. There's a sermon for some of you. Okay? But for the rest of you, what I'm saying is not that. Well, I'm not saying work harder. I'm saying work more effectively. More in the spirit. Huh? I'll prove it to you. You ever have a day in 23 where you were exhausted because you were so busy and at the end of the day you got nothing done? And you're like, I was busy all day and I got nothing done. Yeah. Because you were working on the urgency, not what was important. Well, verse 16 ends, and like I told you, I'm spending most of my time on those verses. Verse 16 ends with this, because the time is evil. Now, again, the times, the times we live in are evil. They had different words in the Greek they could have used. They used this word keros, okay? And it, mean, it means a very distinct, specific, chosen time. Not rather, they had a different word they would have used for like, in general, General moments, they would have used a different word. They used a very specific word here. And they said, no, this is keros. It speaks of specific times. It talks about specific opportunities that we have. So this means that this is the right moment for you to do this. In other words, God is saying to you, this is the right moment. This is the time I have called you for. You ever, you ever played that game where you say, you know, I wish I had been born in the 50s. I, I wish I had been born uh, back in the, you know, uh, the Old West. Because I love horses. I love guns. I wish I could walk around with my six shooters. I wish I was born in the Old West. I like swords. I wish I was born, you know, in the Middle Ages. So I could walk around with a sword. Look at this. Those are so... I guess we just, sometimes we just don't have enough to do, so we do stupid stuff, huh? <laughs> do you understand that God put you in this specific time right now for a specific reason? Do you understand it's not an accident that you are here today? Do you understand I'm not smart enough to come up with this sermon on my own? God gave me these words because he wants you and I to hear them. Me too, I'm not, I gotta hold myself accountable. He wants both of us to hear them today because he knew we were gonna be here today to hear this message right now. It's not an accident. Are you with me? You hear what I'm saying? I mean, that makes it personal. That makes it almost seem like God knew what he was doing and he had a plan the whole time. Huh. Who knew? God had a plan the whole time. God knows exactly 
why you are here, and you're here for a reason. Some of you, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but you're thankful 2023 is over. Because it was a bad year. Relationships, jobs, money, other issues. You're like, man, 2024 can't be as bad. I got news for you. The way this world is fouled up, messed up, it could get worse. I mean, that's how bad this world is. That's why I'm so excited to be in heaven someday. Right when I think the world doesn't have anything more to throw at me, it can throw something else worse. This world is just jacked up. But God has you here in a specific moment for a specific reason. Have you thought about that recently? Why does God have you alive right now? Why didn't God put you back in the 1800s? Why didn't God put you there? God didn't make a mistake. Amen? So if God doesn't make mistakes, amen, then he put you here for a reason. So have you considered what that reason is? What is your purpose? Why are you here? Why does God have you here? There are some people who were a lot healthier than us who started 2023 thinking they were going to see the end of it and didn't see the end of the year. There's some people that ate a lot healthier than I do and didn't make it to the end of the year. So God must have a plan and a reason why he still got me here. Because he knows what he's doing. That's what this word means. He had keros, a distinct time. For a time like this, you say, man, the world has gone crazy. Well, that's good. Because that means God has you here to try to, you know, combat that. Because he has a specific reason why you are here right now. Your gifts, your talents, what he's given you is exactly what he needs to combat the craziness out there. You realize God's gifted you, right? You realize you're here for a purpose, right? Not an accident. I don't care what mom and dad told you. You were not an accident. <laughs> that was just because they were mad at you for not taking out the trash. The last part of that expression says that these days are evil. Listen, that doesn't mean that there are some good days and there are some bad days. This means... All days are evil in this world. They're, listen, this world is messed up. And the only hope is Jesus. And I don't care what you do in 2024, if it's not Jesus, it ain't going to work. You can come up with a different plan. You can say, well, you know what it is? I've been dating guys who are, are, who are bad boys, and so now I better date some nice boys. I got news for you. No boys are going to matter if it ain't Jesus first. He said, well, I just took the wrong job. I need a job where we're doing more nice things for people. I got news for you. No job, no person, no you know, thing, no possession is going to fill that hole. Only Jesus can fill it. That's it. Oh, some of us know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of us maybe even had to deal with some things this year where they might have lost their lives, where, you know what, it was touch and go, where we might not even had you, and now you are here and you realize, oh, you know what, I learned this year, every day is a gift. Amen? Every day is a gift. I think sometimes some of us need a little health scare every once in a while for you to remember, God is good. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Oh, no, I'm not wishing you bad on your health. I'm just saying every once in a while, boy, some of us need to wake up to how blessed we are. It reminds me what uh, Genesis five, 6, 5, and 6, we don't have time for it. Genesis 6, 5, and 6 talks about how God had regret, right? This right before Noah's time. He had regret that he had created people because they were so evil and sinful. That's the world we live in. That's the world we live in. Oh, I know, it's after the flood, that was before the flood. People are still jacked up like they were before the flood. That's why he's going to come again. He is coming again. You realize that, right? 
Do you realize he may come again before the end of 2024? I don't, if I get my way, he's going to come before the elections. Because I'm not looking forward to the whole election time. <laughs> That's going to be a nightmare. Oh, But it's not up to me. It's up to God. And God will be big enough to handle all that junk too. Amen? As a musicians come forward, I, I read those last couple verses for you, even though it's really not main thrust of my sermon, because I want to make the conclusion for verses 17 and 18. Verses 17 and 18, again, said this. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, but, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the way to best use your time in 2024 is to use your time exactly like the Holy Spirit wants you to use it. Not how Lincoln wants you to use it. Not how you want to use it. Okay? Not how anyone else wants you to use it. Use your time this year exactly how the Holy Spirit calls you to use it. You say, well, I'm not sure what the Holy Spirit wants me to do this year. Well, okay. Now you've got your uh, marching orders for this week coming up, don't you? You better start praying, fasting, reading, doing whatever you got to do to figure out what the Holy Spirit wants you to do so that you can get to doing what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. I can't say that again, so don't ask me to. <laughs> you better get to work. Because if it's that important, we better get to it quick. Amen? The only way to live 2024 the best so that in 365 days, on the 29th of December 2024, when whoever is left still comes together and we meet again for New Year's sermon again, we can say, I lived a great year. Why? Because I did what the Holy Spirit called me to do. Everything else will be pointless. Everything else. It comes right down to that. See, I could have just preached that one line to you and let you go a five-minute sermon. <laughs> but I didn't. Would you stand with me? The question of whether or not you use your time wisely just comes down to how much of this year do you spend doing what the Holy Spirit tells you to do and how much of this year do you spend doing what you want to do? Doing what the Holy Spirit wants you to do makes for a good year. Doing what you want to do doesn't do so much. I'll finish with this verse. A goal for... 2024 ought to be Psalms 90, verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach me to number my days. Teach me to, to be thankful for every day so I can grow more wise every day doing the will of God. Amen? If you've got something for this year you want to pray for, if you've got some regrets that you have from last year, um, join the club. <laughs> I'm not just a member, I'm the president of that club, the Regret Club, or as it's commonly known, Lincoln's Gang, the Regret Club. We all got them, amen? We've all made mistakes, we've all sinned this year. If we could go back, there's a lot of things I'd do different. So rather than sit here and cry and whine about it, how about we just correct those things for 24, amen? amen. God's given us the gift of today. Let's make them better and not sit here and think about the mistakes we made in the past. Let's use God and the Holy Spirit while we can to make them right. You got something you want to pray about. You got a decision you want to make. You want just pray for somebody. You can do it right there. You can come down here. We can pray with you. Whatever's on your heart, you come as you sing.